Hi everyone, my name is Arthur. I'm a systems engineer at Cloudflare, and I'm here to tell you about how we migrated our DOS mitigation system, so denial of service attack mitigation system, to XDP. So a bit about us. Uh, we are kind of a big content delivery network, so we serve lots of cat pictures. We have about 170 points of presence among the world uh, where we serve the cat pictures. And uh, we do about 10 million HTTP requests per second. So we end up seeing a lot of traffic and a lot of malicious traffic and a lot of denial of service attacks. And we've, have our, we've had our new XTP based solution in production for about six months now. So a bit about what is a denial of service attack and what we see on our end. So it's pretty much a constant occurrence. It's just a part of doing business for us. Uh, we are under denial of service attacks, or distributed denial of service attacks every day, all the time. There's always attacks somewhere. For the purpose of this talk, we're mostly going to focus on layer four denial of service attacks, uh, because that's kind of what I do with, and we're going to forget about L7, because those are much more complicated. Um, so the two major kinds of attacks we see over layer four are kind of TCP flood attacks, where we just get big floods of SYN or ACK packets, usually with a kind of a source, uh, a spoofed source address, or UDP amplification attacks, and those are mainly either DNS or memcache, which we saw about a year ago when there was that big bug. Uh, one notable point is that we use Anycast everywhere, so all of our data centers advertise the exact same IP ranges everywhere. So distributed denial of service attacks tend to hit us in a very distributed way. We tend to see the attacks in most of our data centers everywhere. It's rare that we get attacks that single out kind of a single location. And so these are two examples of what we see on our end. So this is kind of a global view inside Cloudflare of what traffic we're seeing when we get attacks. As you can see, it's pretty obvious. They're hard to miss, uh, which makes our life easy, which is good. So the top is what happened when the memcached uh, UDP amplification attacks hit. So we get, got about 800 gigabits per second of kind of a junky traffic. And at this point, normal traffic levels are pretty much just noise in the graph. And we can see the same thing on the bottom here. We have a TCP SYN flood that hit, uh, hit us and it got up to about 300 million packets per second. And once again, normal traffic is just noise at this point, which makes our lives easy because at least we can detect the attacks. And so our mitigation pipeline is kind of three major steps. So packets come in, they hit an edge server, and that's over any cast. And then we send a sampled, uh, so can we sample incoming packets and send a small fraction of these to a centralized system called Gatebot. Gatebot aggregates all the traffic it's receiving and does magic to figure out which traffic is malicious or which traffic is a denial of service attack. From that, we put out uh, rules which describe which packets are incoming denial of service attack packets and push these out to back to the edge. Now, it's important to note here that we need to sample packets before we drop them because we want to keep the feedback loop going even when we're dropping packets to know if the attack is still ongoing or not. That's pretty much it. So rules. So we tend to have one per signature attack. Sometimes attack have, attacks have multiple signatures. Uh, so there can be hundreds of rules at the same time, and they all need to match. And so we only let a packet through if it matches none of the rules we have deployed right now. And so our rules have two kind of key parts to them. We have a classic BPF filter, so no, not extended BPF, classic BPF. And uh, the gist of this is that it's very flexible. This lets us match on any part of the packet. Uh, and CVPF is great for this, because that's all it lets you do. It lets you match packets. There are lots of tools to generate CVPF. So we have our own BPF tools product, which is on GitHub. And that lets us generate CVPF matching DNS queries. So we can say uh, any, any DNS query matching you know, foo.example.com should match. Uh, from POF, POF is kind of a small DSL for describing IP and TCP header options and what order they're coming. Because uh, usually attackers are kind of dumb, and they read the same software, and some of the header bits are the same or whatever. And libpcap, or TCP dump, also generates classic BPF, which lets us generate even more filters for our programs. And we can run them in lots of places as well. So you can run them in the kernel with SO attached filter. You can run them in IP tables with XTVPF. And we can also run them in user space. Lots of languages have interpreters or VMs for CVPF. Second part of our rule is the target data centers. So I know I said that most of our attacks were distributed all over the world. But sometimes we do get attacks that focus on one data center. So we want the ability to scope rules to specific data centers in some cases. And so now on XTP, so I'm sure most of you have heard what XTP is before, but we'll do a quick little recap. So XTP uses eVPF, which is extended BPF. Um, and one of the main things that we use for that is helper functions. So we can call into the kernel from BPF to have the kernel do some bits for us. And the main one we use is tail calling, which lets us chain eVPF programs together. So we can have one eVPF program that decides, OK, I'm done processing this packet onto the next eVPF program. Um, and we also have uh, the kernel verifier, which checks that our eVPF program is correct, does not do out-of-bounds packet accesses, does not read random kernel memory. 
Uh, and this is great, but it comes with lots of limits. So the verifier imposes strict complexity limits on the actual eBPF code we get to run. So we're limited to 4,000 instructions right now, and you can only do 32 tail calls in one go. There are also limits to your stack usage, how many branches you can have at the same time. So these are all things to keep in mind. Um, and XTP is really just a mechanism to attach a single eBPF program to an interface. And the program and the chain of programs it chains calls, tail calls into runs for every packet we receive, and the two actions we care about is we can either pass it and then it reaches the normal Linux networking stack or we can drop it and it just disappears, which is great. So if we remember, this is kind of what our mitigation pipeline looks like. And at first glance, it seems like we want to do all the dropping in XTP. It seems perfect. We can have a rule, XTP drop, everything's great. Now the one thing to remember is we need to sample before we drop. So kind of a requirement of dropping packets in XTP is that we need to be able to sample them in XTP as well. And so this is kind of what we could imagine it would look like. So I've drawn little dots over the XTP parts. So we could have a sampler alpha program that would somehow sample packets, send them off to Gatebot, and then we would tail call into a dropping elf, which would either pass it on up the stack or drop the packet. Seems simple enough. Um, so first, the sampling. So we need to tail call uh, into the next potential rule dropping program, which means we need to somehow copy the packets out. We need some kind of a side channel to submit our sampled packets outside of the whole XDP program chain. Um, thankfully, we need a really low sample rate. As we saw in the graphs, attacks tend to be really big, so even tiny sample rates serve as well. Uh, it turns out there is an, uh, a kernel BPF helper called perf event output, which lets you put whatever you want in a kind of a perf event, and we can put, turns out you can put the whole packet as well. So we can put the whole packet in a perf event, which ends up in a perf ring buffer, and then we can read that from user space. And that has a nice property of uh, degrading gracefully as well. Perf is kind of meant to be a lossy thing where if you put too many events, they'll just get lost along the way. And for sampling, that works great as well. If we get a huge attack and our sample rate is set too high, we'll drop the extra samples and, well, so what? So sampling, done. How do we drop things though? So if you remember, our rules have two main parts. We have got the classic BPF filter, and that sucks. We can't really just eval that in eBPF. There's no magic helpers for anything like this, which kind of means that we need to compile our rules in. Uh, instead of having, you can imagine we could have one generic eBPF program and our rules would be stored in a map and we could look them up, but with the CBPF this doesn't work. And since we have to build our rules in, then the complexity limits start being a challenge because the more rules we have, the more complex the program is and the, the closer we get to the complexity limits imposed to us by the kernel. We also have this target data center thing and uh, compiling eBPF can be a bit faffy. You need to generate the code, then usually compile it with Clang and we really don't want to do this all across our edge on thousands of servers at the same time. It's error prone, it's wasteful. So we want to compile one elf, distribute it everywhere in a key, key value store, but we still want to be able to specialize the elf or do something to restrict what rules are enabled in it. So if you imagine this is kind of what if we, our C template looks like when we're generating rules. So we have kind of our main XTP entry point here, and it's pretty simple. If the first rule matches, drop the packet, go on to every rule. If no rules matched, then we pass the packet. Must be fine. Um, so the first part is converting the classic BPF. So at first you think this is going to be great. eBPF was kind of designed to be uh, converted to from classic BPF, and the kernel can do this. If you SO attach filter now and use classic BPF and you have an eBPF JIT, the kernel will convert the classic BPF to eBPF for you and JIT it. But that only works for SO attach filter. So we kind of have to compile or convert this on our own. So we ended up writing a compiler to compile classic BPF to C. Because then the idea is that we can embed it in our C template and compile it uh, to eBPF with Clang which is also nice because Clang can sometimes do some co-optimizations cool between rules and stuff. And most of the instructions kind of map one-to-one, -one, so ALU, so all the math operations, most of the jumps kind of have one-to-one -one direct mapping between classic VPF and eVPF, which makes our life much easier. Um, so here's an example, though, of an instruction that really sucks, packet loads. So in classic VPF, you can't easily check the bounds of packets, how long the packet is. So the idea with classic VPF is you just write your filter and you say, byte four needs to match, and if the packet is not four bytes long, the kernel will just say your filter does not match, which is fair enough. You want your packet to be at least that much long. But um, the problem with that is that that exits your program. So if you want to combine multiple of these filters together, we can't have the, fil the first filter that makes an out-of-bound packet access return all of our filters. We need to run them all all the time. So for this, though, thankfully, eBPF offers much more generic ways of loading memory. So from eBPF, you can load a pointer, dereference it, have offsets. And thankfully, XDP gives us a packet pointer we can just use. So that's great, but we need to check the bounds everywhere. And that ended up sucking a bit because a single classic BPF instruction, something like here we're just loading a 32-bit word from byte 12 of the packet, ends up being at least four instructions in eBPF. And this doesn't even include the endianess thing. Uh, classic BPF always returns packet loads in the native endianess, 
Uh, so here we also need to do a byte swap if we're on little onion, which is most of the time. Uh, and this sucks even more for BPF indirect, which lets us load kind of uh, packets with variable offsets, so we can use another register to calculate the offset. Then we need to do a bunch more faffing around, and that ends up being at least six instructions, which is a lot, especially when we have our 4K limit and we want to support hundreds of rules everywhere. So uh, it turns out, though, that we can do much better than this. So if we imagine a typical classic BPF program, it turns out that most of them uh, load a byte, and so you can imagine that they're, they load bytes in increasing order. So first they check the IP header, then they check a UDP header, then they check a DNS header or something. And so most of them check the first byte they want to check, and then either they fall through to the next checks or they return no match. So in most classic BPF programs, the only way for the packet to match is for every single load to happen. And so with this, we can just have a single packet balance check at the start that checks for the greatest access and we don't actually end up changing the semantics of the program. We return from a different place, but we'll always return the same value because the packet needs to be at least that long to match in the first place. Um, and this ends up being quite a saving. So here on this graph, we've compiled some filters. So the first two are TCP dump styles filters that we generate with libpcap, and the bottom one is one from our BPF tools project to generate a classic BPF that matches a DNS subquery. And the first column, CBPF, shows how many classic BPF instructions that filter actually is. And then CVPFC is the name we've given to our classic VPF compiler, generate C, and how many EVPF instructions that is that generated after it passed through Clang. So it's not great, but it's not terrible. Uh, and then on the third column, we have how many instructions that ends up in x86 once it's generated by the kernel. And on the right column for the kernel, it's just for comparison of what SO attached filter ends up doing when it converts your classic VPF to EVPF. Now it's not entirely apples to apples comparison because for some reason, socket filters in eVPF don't get to access the skbuff data pointer. They can only use the old load indirect, load absolute stuff. And in eVPF, that ends up calling a socket load helper, which means that you have to make a VPF call, which means you clobber a bunch of registers, and it's a lot of faffing around. Um, and that's why the kernel is so inefficient. We have almost like a 2x improvement in doing this just ourselves compared to what the kernel managed to do in a socket filter. And now compile once, run everywhere. So this is really key. We really don't want to faff around with clang, compiling all of our BPF, and converting all this everywhere on the edge. And we want to enable disable rules. So if you remember initially our thing where we have several rules one after the other, we want to have a single program with multiple rules, and we want to selectively enable or disable each and every one of these rules. And it turns out that the first impression, we'd be like, oh, we can do this in a map. BPF has, BPF has maps. We can look up values in maps. We can store program IDs as keys or something and check if the rule's enabled. This ends up being really expensive, though. Uh, a map lookup is four instructions minimum by the time you've set up all the arguments for the VPF calling convention and actually made the call and checked the return value. And the verifier makes sure you check the return value. And it also clobbers a bunch of registers. R0 and R5 are clobbered, which means that Clang will spill a bunch of registers to the stack and then spill them back. And for us, on average, a single map lookup for a rule like this ended up being 10 instructions, which is a lot when you only have 4,000 and you need hundreds of rules. So instead, it seems like we want to kind of just modify the elf instead or do something like this. It turns out that works. So if we write code like this, so the key part here is that we have a single enabled variable. And so imagine we repeat this for every rule. And we load that, and so that variable is assigned to a register. And then we emit a single 64-bit BPF load using the inline assembly into that register. And the key part here is that if you put a symbol name in the inline assembly, which I've highlighted here, rule zero is enabled in yellow, that then shows up in the relocation info of the elf. Um, and then we just check the value of that register. And this is great. So if we dump, actually dump the relocation info of an elf compiled like this, we find the offset of our load instruction. And at runtime, all we have to do is find all the symbols named rule and then underscore ID, whatever enabled, and rewrite all these loads to either load zero to disable the rule or load one to enable the rule. And this gets even better. It turns out the verifier prunes constant branches like this. So the verifier tracks the value of uh, variables in registers. And seeing as we do one 64-bit constant load, it knows that the register has a constant value and then it knows that we're using this in a jump with a constant value. And so if the rule's disabled, it'll knock out the whole rule. And if the rule is enabled, it'll knock out just the check and the rule's always there. So this has a zero runtime cost, which is great. Now onto debugging. So this is all great and we're dropping packets everywhere. How do we actually figure out what we're dropping though when we have a problem? So metrics only go so far. We have me great metrics and you can put them in BPF maps and we have metrics of drop packets per rule and we can tell which rules are dropping how many packets. But if we're searching for a needle in a haystack, there's one packet that's being dropped or disappearing or something, it can be really hard to figure out what actually happened to it. So we really want some kind of TCP dump-like tool where we want a filter to match the packet that we're looking for, and we want to be able to look at the packet and see what happened to it. Now it turns out we already have all the things we need to do this. Uh, we already talked about libpcap and TCP dump, and that just generates classic VPF. 
And we've just talked about how we can now convert classic BPF to eBPF. And we can also use perf to output matching packets. So we can use any TCP dump filter, compile it to classic BPF, compile that to extended BPF, <laughs> add some extra eBPF to use perf, and that would be some eBPF that would filter out packets and match on anything we want. Uh, and now for this, we uh, updated our uh, classic BPF to eBPF compiler to generate directly eBPF instead of going through C and Clang because it was a lot of faffing around to get this for so little. Um, and so this is kind of currently what our setup looks like. And so the big question is, how do we hook this in? We don't really, we need to tail call into this extra program we've made somehow, but how to do that? And so we always want to tail call into it. And um, that's fine because it turns out that the tail call helper is really great this way. And then if you tail call and nothing is attached, it's a no op. So tail calling with nothing has pretty much zero runtime performance overhead, so we can just tail call all the time. And if we do this at the end of the chain and at the start, we can also uh, get the final action that the packet took. Because until we get to the final program, it's just tail calls, and we don't know if the packet was supposed to be XTP dropped or XTP passed, if that makes sense. Um, and the great part of doing it at the end as well is in the case of other projects, so we're also working on a load balancing project where we modify packets, then we can actually get the dump of the modified packet and see what it looks like. And so this ends up looking something like this. So after the drop elf, we tail call into two separate filter programs. And those are the ones that we've compiled from CVPF to EVPF and do perf. And both of these programs have the action embedded in them. And we can then output that as perf metadata. And then a user space uh, daemon is going to read from the perf ring buffer and output that to a pcap. And this works really well because we can even add the um, action that was taken as the interface metadata in the pcap file. And then we have a, an annotated pcap with all the packets that we saw and what XDP action they actually took. So this is all great. Now there are some pain points, the main ones being the complexity limits. Uh, we always want to support more and more rules and we never really know how many, it's hard to place an upper bound on the amount of rules we need at any given point in time and different rules end up being vastly different in the number of instructions they actually use. Uh, so we've been trying to do lots of work on reducing the amount of instructions and supporting more rules. Uh, an early attempt involved trying to actually uh, brute force rules into ELFs so the idea was that we would put all of our rules into a single elf, shove it through the verifier, and if the verifier complained, we would assume that we had too many rules or hit some complexity limit. Because the problem is there are lots of different complexity limits and they all have different error nodes and they're all really hard to check for. And then if we hit that limit, we would just have some terrible heuristic to try and guesstimate how many instructions each rule used so we could move some rules to different elfs. And we would keep doing this until we ended up with a set of elfs that had all the rules we needed and then we could just chain the elfs together. Now this sounds great, but it was terrible. Um, it was really hard to debug and very unreproducible because it depended a lot on which kernel you were actually compiling these rules because lots of verifier limits are tweaked all the time and it was really hard to actually reproduce this. So for now we've decided to stick with just increasing the kernel complexity limits to sane values and close enough. Uh, another thing is that Clang eVPF inline assembly kind of sucks. You can't really specify what opcodes you want to use. You have to use this C-like syntax to guesstimate what instruction it's giving you. And if you mess it up, the instructions just get silently dropped. Um, which makes it really fun. Uh, we've also been working on uh, race-free rate limiting. So most of our rules we discussed here are either drop or pass the packet. But in lots of conditions, we actually just want to rate limit specific packets. So especially like if you can imagine we have, uh, we want to rate limit new TCP connections, we can just rate limit new SYN packets coming in. Um, but implementing a race-free token bucket in eVPF cheaply is actually really hard because there are no proper atomic instructions. So you can lock xAd, which adds atomically, but you don't get the previous value out. There's no compare or swap or no fetch and add, really. Uh, but we're working on implementing that. And yeah, so thanks for eVPF. It runs CVPF great. Um, and here are some links to things. So BPF Tools is our POF and DNS to CVPF compiler, which we use for matching packets and rules. rules. Uh, CVPFC is our classic BPF to C or to eVPF compiler. And that's not quite open source yet, but it should be next week. So the link will work next week for GitHub. And same for XTP cap, that's our XTP packet capture tool that uses CVPFC, and that should be open source next week. And new tools eVPF is the loader we use that's entirely in Go that allows doing this uh, runtime kind of uh, elf fudging to enable and disable rules for us. And that is it. Any questions? <coughs> Excellent. Questions? Yeah. Oh, great talk. Uh, since quick folks are here, uh, yeah. and do uh, you think it would replace TCP? Do you think you can do like sin flood detection for quick 
in XDP or do you need to decrypt packets? And it's, it seems harder. Uh, we haven't looked into it that much, but it seems uh, there's a lot less we can do in XDP without being able to decrypt the packets. I see. So just getting the raw packet seems kind of hard. We can do rate limiting, I think, based on like destination IP and stuff, but nothing much more. Right? But not on the connection. Yeah, I think. Somebody else? Come on, this is a great talk. There should be plenty of questions. No questions. So, um, to reply to that comment uh, that you made, um, I think I had asked this question of Ian before. If the, you know, if the kinds of attacks Quick would have would be similar to TCP or not, and the minimum packet size in Quick is not tiny like Synflood, so it's hard to send that many packets. Um, like this huge stream of small packets, basically, to bring down a server. Uh, sorry, this is not entirely, I'm here, yeah. This is not entirely true because the main bottleneck of an attacker is not the size of the packet, the bandwidth, but, but uh, the main cost is about writing a packet, the network card, and with quick you will just see the, the same SYN flood, but not the same packet rate, above the same packet rate probably, but with higher bandwidth. So, yeah, it, uh, having, having an MTU sized first uh, initial packet doesn't help you at all, it, it uh, actually makes things worse. Um, so for what it's worth, there is a um, SYN cookie-like mechanism that's built into Quick now. Uh, I'm here in the front row. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's, yes. there's a SYN cookie-like mechanism mm -hmm. built into Quick now. It's called a retry packet. Okay. So if I receive a packet and I am, I, I, the server decides that it's, it's undergoing DOS, mm -hmm. I can simply send a retry packet to ensure that the client is where it says it is, for example. So I can, I can choose to not respect zero RTT handshakes. Right. Like there are mitigations for, for, for DOS. That's ultimately what we're yeah. looking for. So that you all happens in user space, though? Uh, um, that happens, well... That's an implementation yeah. question you're asking, right? So how you send a retry, if you send a retry for every single client hello that comes in, then you can certainly do it in simple XDP with no encryption. With, with, with so the retries aren't that. encrypted? Uh, they are, no, they're not. Okay. So, so the, the token that's actually sent in the retry is sent in, in, in plain text. So you can totally do this in XDP and-, and But how do you tell new connections from existing connections? What happens if you send a retry to an existing connection? You can tell from the packet type, okay. and that's visible. So, so there are, so there are mitigations that one can one can talk about and one can build for this, uh, especially for the DOS condition for the for, mm -hmm. for, for for the DOS situation. You can absolutely build something that that runs uh, much faster than the rest of the stack does. Thanks. Anybody else? Oh, well, I have to say I'm surprised. Okay. I'll have a question for you. Sure. I think it's going to be. So you know how you said the path event output was dropping sometimes and you didn't care? Sorry. Uh, what you're saying, uh, one of your slides was showing this uh, mm -hmm. call, I, I think. Go backwards a few. How do I go back? Uh, way back. Yeah, um, this one? The, the path event output. Yeah. Yeah, that, that thing there. Yeah. He says it, it, you're happy that it drops. It can't keep up with you. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of, it fails gracefully. So <laughs> in, in the case where we would be overwhelmed with too many packets, samples That's are dropped, it. which is what we want, and that works out fine. Okay, but it has no back pressure. It doesn't, you know, you yeah. just keep sending, even though it... Yeah, can't. we keep sending. Right. But uh, I think if the ring buffer spool is pretty cheap, because it just checks the ring buffer spool and then just drops it. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, but... Right. But a, a socket will actually, you, you, you'll find out it's when it's full. I, think, I don't think this thing is. Yeah, so we, we can't know if it's full from EBPF, yeah. but as soon as we call the helper, the helper will well, know if there's no more room in the room. Although one funny thing about that thing, in user space you know that the event yeah, just dropped. I guess so. <laughs> but not to the kind of, yeah. anyways. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, okay. and we have, we, you can add your own metrics in EBPF for this pretty easily. So we have our own metrics for how many times perf error, how many packets we've sent over perf, and how many we've actually received, and you can have pretty good statistics. Questions? 
You mentioned you do some other stuff in L7. Uh, uh, do you handle any HTTP uh, drops in XDP2? Or no, we don't do any HTTP, okay. like in pa pack like deep, deep HTTP inspection in XDP, no. Okay. So only, there's no DPI in? No, only for DNS, really. Okay. Um, Okay, so if there are no more questions. I, I have a question. Oh. Uh, so you mentioned the, there is different semantics in reading data from bucket from so attach filter versus XDP? Yeah. So, uh, and you mentioned that in one case it's a, it's, a, um, uh, it's, a, it's a pointer, in the other case it's a function call. Yeah. Is it fixable? What, do you know why that yeah, is? Yeah, so I'm not entirely sure if anyone does know this. Why, if you attach, if you use SO attach BPF on a socket with an eBPF program, then you're not allowed to read the data pointer from the SK buff. It's there and it exists in the SK buff. And if you're privileged and you're loading like a TC filter, you get the same SK buff and you're allowed to read the data pointer. Uh, but from unprivileged SO attach filter, you cannot, which uh, is a bit wonky. Sorry, why do you want to read the data pointer? For what? Well, it's much, I mean, it, it, so it's just kind of a remark that it's much cheaper. So if you want to have, if you do SO attach uh, BPF right now with an eBPF program, you have to use load absolute and load indirect. Yes. Which ends up being a function call, which ends up being like 10 instructions to do a single Yeah, because load. all these function calls uh, do the appropriate um, sure. pool what? of data, out, which is not in the scabby head. But only, only XDP, you have uh, all the data in one frame in one portion of memory. Oh, but right. for arbitrary SKB, uh, the, the, the But then the you can still read it can from, but from TC, you can still read the data pointer yourself, as long as you're privileged. There's a check in the verifier. If Capsis admin, you can read the data pointer yourself. I'm sh not sure what, what you want to do with this data pointer. No, I'm just saying you, you can do it from TC. I, I don't particularly want to do this. Uh, we don't use, I don't use socket uh, so attach EVPF or anything. I think you can read the data pointer only if the verifier can make sure that you are not going to ex read a byte above the, the frame. So, yeah. and that's a verifier limit. I'm not sure you can. I don't know. It, it seems you can do that in TC, but I don't know. I, I haven't looked into it that much. Really. All right. Thanks. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.